and purified the nation of Israel so that their hearts and lives would be ready before God can work in your life. Moses was alerted. Maybe I'm in the body who just been knocked down by fire. And they all come in the sanctuary. Can you imagine Aaron? Can you imagine Aaron walking in, finding two of his four boys, half of his, 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 his legacy, burnt and laying on the floor in their tunic? You say, Pastor, what does that mean? You remember our study with, 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 with Dick Dobbins when we, we talked about uh, the, the tunic that was given to every priest, that it was literally laid upon them from above. The anointing comes from above. Here were guys in their tunic. The indication of their service to God. They were in their tunic being jocular in front of God, being frivolous, being lighthearted with the things of God and standing at an altar. They were stricken. And found their life terminated just like that. Even in their tomb. Even in their garments of the priest. Even in that thing that represents them as the minister of the house. Moses said, you call for your family to come and get these boys, get them out of the sanctuary. Get them out away from the front of the tent of meetings. I want them away from the tent of meetings. And you and your two boys and your wife stay in the tent. You don't leave because if you leave, you'll die with your sons. Because a root of bitterness will arise at the loss of your sons. You let them be buried in their tunics. And you stay in the presence of God. Let me tell you something, church. The judgment of God is going to be hard. And the only way for the church to deal with the judgment of God is to stay cuddled up to the brazen altar of repentance. And then move very cautiously into the sanctuary of praise and worship. Aaron had nothing to say. It was normal for, for Eastern cultural people when their kids were killed to rip their garment. They're covering off their head. Every priest was covered in his head. It was normal for them to rip it off and to tear their garment. But we know from history what tearing of that garment meant. It meant that Aaron's entire ministry as a priest, his, his whole ministry in, in the lineage that was to follow would have been destroyed by him rending the, the tunic that he was wearing with the double seam garment around the neck. We know that because we've studied the culture. We know what the Word says in Judaic law. He can't if he rends that. His ministry is over. Moses said, you be very careful. You don't rent your tunic. You don't uncover. You don't come with unkempt hair, the King James says. You keep that covering over your head. You don't let this emotional episode destroy your relationship to God. Let me tell you, some of you are going to go through hell in your life. You say, how do you know that? The, the psalmist David wrote the 23rd division of the psalm. Yet will I walk through the valley of the shed of death. I don't know about you, but losing somebody I love is about as bad as it gets. I was laying in my bed the other night as, as Les and them had sent me pictures of the, the, the young people around the altar at, the, at the, the ministry the other night. And I laid in my bed and I thought to myself, what if that had been Mason who had gotten next to the fire and his clothes had been caught in a fire and, and he was laying there in second and third degree burns all over the lower half of his body. How would, how would Pastor react? I would be angry at who didn't watch him and maybe it was me. I would have been mad. I would have been upset in my spirit because I love my boys. Moses said, you got to stay in the door of the tent. You don't go where this is. You know these boys were, were not doing what they were supposed to do. They were out of step with the Spirit of God. We're going to bury them away from the sanctuary. But you and your other two boys and your wife, you get in here and you stay here and don't you leave because you will die. Church, when the worst things happen in your life, you don't run from the sanctuary you get in. Amen. <coughs> When everything in the world has happened in your life and it's total destruction, you, you get yourself in and you cover yourself up and you get close to that brazen altar because there's fire burning there that emanated from God. Let me tell you, when you get close to the fire of God, it won't burn you. It will set you alight. 
I'm talking about opening your understanding for ministry, Rich. I'm talking about taking you out of the, the realm where things tend to knock us off our stride a little bit or get us caught up in, in things that are not good for us. I, I'm talking about the brazen altar which through the fire of God, through the illumination of the Holy Spirit, begins to work and takes away some of those heaviest temptations from us and delivers us from evil. That's what Jesus prayed. Deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Why did Jesus pray that? Because He had been tempted. He had been faced with those issues. He knew what those issues were. Church, cuddle up to the brazen altar. If you're going to fill your censer with fire, you fill it with, with the fire of God that emanates out of the presence of God. You say, look, I want some of that real deal stuff. I know some of you are going, boy, I'm not sure this is, a, this is a Pentecostal church. We don't see what we're looking for. I'm telling you, folks, we've got to get there. We've got to keep pushing and, and going. Lynette, what you saw at that meeting can be here. But we've got to be participants. We've got to set the standard. We've got to lift our hands. We've got to open our mouth. You say, well, I, I was thinking somebody would come and do that for us, and I just followed them. I'm sorry, there's nobody for you to call on. Get in step with the Holy Spirit. Walk into the brazen altar, be purified by the fire of God. Lift your hands and begin to glorify God and issue an evidence of praise that literally fumigates the throne of God and said, I'll lead us in the Pentecost. Amen. You're going to have to accept God's a miracle. You're going to have to stop worrying about how you look. Let me tell you, people know what kind of church this is. They see your car parked out there every week. You can't. You ain't going to deny it. They're going to think you already act like us. You might as well. <laughs> they think you are lined up with an idiot pastor anyway. Thanks, Rod. <laughs> I tell you, when the fire of God falls, it won't have anything to do with me. It will have to do with hearts that are hungry right. well, of the things of God. People who aren't taking a light to the call of God. I've said to these kids that are playing music and singing and doing that, I've tried to impress upon them the seriousness of what they did. I I'm telling you, Les, take it. What's your name, Caleb? <laughs> to, to that revival the other night to, to, to sing it has impacted his life. And it's going to do more because I'm going to tell you, it's going to take you out of the realm of being able to, to kind of play the, the, the fence and be one of them. You're going to serve the Lord wholeheartedly or you're going to get off the fence. Because when you get up and sing that song and people's lives are changed, you can't go with jocularity back into the sanctuary and act like everything's okay. You've got to sanctify yourself and set yourself apart for ministry. Now, Caleb's probably going, I ain't never doing that again. <laughs> Let me tell you, God's given you a gift. Amen. Every one of these kids, Alex, Daniel, all these kids were saved. You've got gifts. You can be like the rest of the world. You, you can have the attitude of the rest of the world. And you know what? These kids that are dying, you know, it breaks my heart that the two kids out of the same class in school over terror were killed in their car accident. Folks, it could happen to anyone. I was talking to some people today about our bikes, and, and I said last year uh, uh, Bobby Tucker was killed, and the year before Dave and Bobby had a bad wreck, and it's kind of hit close to home. I tell you what, you, you have to begin to weigh some things. You need to be ready because you don't know. I know the world didn't end yesterday at six o'clock. I didn't have any fear that it was going to. Had it ended, that's okay. I was ready. Amen. Had my feet propped up at six o'clock, and I said, "Let me get ready." That's what it <laughs> you don't have to lose your sense of humor in the presence of God. You, you don't have to lose your sense of understanding of reality. But what you've got to do is learn to separate when it's time to play and when it's time to get serious. You see, Nadab and Abihu had just been promoted to this new uh, place of, of, of real importance and they knew it. That they were being looked at by two and a half million people as the sons of Aaron. This is the high priest of the Judaic church. The church was two and a half million strong. This was the pastor and his sons. Right. 
I watch pastor's sons. Amen. Billy Graham's son played the game until he was 22 years of age until they had to make a decision. There's going to be a drug addict or a hell that's going to follow after his dad and preach the gospel. Mark and Randy Gorman both had to make a decision in their lives. Here's a daddy preaching the gospel. Hundreds of thousands of people watching them on television and listening to them on the radio. Randy and Mark couldn't ha have a relationship with God based on their daddy's relationship. They had to have one of their own. Right. David George, his son, went for years, played ball, great ball player, an unbelievable athlete, and yet there was a part of him that hated the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because it required that we live our lives in a discipline. Rejected. David had come to preach a revival for us in Leeds for one year, and uh, he had gone to the grocery store from his hotel to get some bananas and things. He's kind of a weird eater. And not that bananas are weird, but he's a weird eater. He's almost a big guy. And he had gone, and when he got there, he slipped and fell and had a serious concussion. This guy's had more brain concussions than anybody I've ever seen in my life. They called me to the hotel. He was down. I got him to the hospital. The doctor said, you got to get him back to Houston. So I called the pastor over in Natchitoches, Louisiana, had him bring his Silver Eagle bus over, put him in a queen size bed, drove him home. I, I wanted Dave's son there to help me get him out of the bus into the house so we could get him some care. His word to his mom, I ain't standing around you, spending all the people. He fled the city. Because he didn't want anything to do. One day, God tracked him down through the power of the Holy Spirit, and he had to make a decision. Now David George's son is not fleeing from the Lord. He is serving with his father many, many days and months and weeks at a time in Cuba, preaching the gospel. You've heard little Mike <clears throat> Chester, who's come to preach for us. Mikey Chester was playing with a firecracker and a bucket of gasoline when he was eight or nine years old, decided he was going to have a big celebration. <coughs> Let the firecracker, threw it in the bucket of gas, blew up, burnt 70, 80% of his body. He is scarred horribly. On top of that, he has keloid skin, so the scars are very thick. They're hard to deal with. It is unbelievable. It consumed his esophagus and his airway. They cut a trait for many, many years as a little guy. He never was a little, he was kind of a big boy, but, but when he was a young kid, he would have that trait and he would talk and he was constantly trying to be a spectator. Constantly. He, he knew that he was disfigured, he knew that he would never be ex accepted by the mainstream, and so he was going to be as obnoxious as he could be. But all of the time that he was being obnoxious, that boy wanted to play football. Because his daddy was a gamer. He could play the game. Mikey was bigger than that. And he was going to play, and they said, You'll never play, you can't play with a tray. We'll never clear you to play. He said, Well, I'm going to play football. My daddy believes that God can heal. Wasn't that Mikey believed it, but his daddy believed it. So Mikey went to his daddy and his mommy and said, You say God can heal, I want him to heal me so I can play football. Mike and Marigold, being the parents that they are, never wavered. They joined hands with their son and prayed in the name of Jesus. And within just a very short period of time, doctors made a, an appointment to close his trait, let him breathe on his own, and by the next August the 14th, he was in two a days practicing high school football. He played high school football, he played college football to the glory of and the glory and the glory of God. Yeah. Because they said He never would. And they, today He will come and preach and He's coming next year here. I believe in October to preach revival for us. But I'm going to tell you what. He believes in the power of God to heal. You know why? He's experienced. He can take everything up. He can still be the little pistol he was before he decided God had him. 